Uh, Kelly, thank you for those uh, opening remarks. I much appreciate it. So uh, I am here in my capacity as the chair of the COAG Working Group, looking at the development of national hydrogen strategy. But I'm going to take the opportunity to give you a, a full overview of what hydrogen means, where the opportunities lie. OK, um, there's the dictionary definition that hydrogen is an opportunity for Australia. You all get that. I want you to use your imagination and imagine you're piloting a spacecraft coming back from a long interstellar journey to Earth 100 years from now, and you look out and you see a planet that 100 years from now is still magnificent in the way that we are accustomed to seeing Earth. It's not that easy to have the belief, to have the faith, because there are many threats to that vision. And they're serious threats. Fundamentally, greenhouse gas emissions, which I think most of us would agree is a global and massive threat um, that needs to be considered. So if you ask yourself, where do you start? Where are the richest pickings for dealing with this threat? You've got to look at where the emissions are coming from. Now, globe, that figure's from 2013, because I can't get exactly this for a more recent date, but nothing's changed in a substantial fashion. The vast bulk of the greenhouse gas emissions come from the energy sector. So more than 70% of all the greenhouse gas emissions just come from the energy that we need. There's nothing more fundamentally important for a society, for civilization, than energy, and that's reflected in the dominant contribution it makes, unfortunately, to greenhouse gas emissions. So energy is where the rich pickings are. It provides the biggest bang for the buck. So we need to pull out the toolkit and do something to fix the problem, but it turns out that our toolkit is relatively restricted. There are a lot of tools in there, but somebody's saying no, you can't use them all. And what restricts them are the practical realities and community values that say no to certain tools in our toolkit. If you look at the zero emissions toolkit, there's quite a few things in there. But realistically, can we use them all? So I don't have oil, coal and gas. I'm looking at the zero emissions solutions. Can we use them? Well, in Australia, in many developed countries, the answer is no when it comes to nuclear. It's an absolutely zero <coughs> emissions technology. It's helped to solve our problems, but it's not, not available to us. When was the last time we built a large-scale hydroelectric dam in Australia? It was more than 50 years ago. I don't see any move towards building any in future. Other than that, it's a fantastic source of energy, clean, synchronous, dispatchable, it's got all the buzzwords that you would want. Biofuels, they tend to rule themselves out. They're not as good as they claim in terms of being zero emissions, plus we just don't have nearly enough land to use them in a substantial fashion. We might use them in niches, but not in a substantial fashion. Then there's a cluster of geothermal wave and tidal. They've ruled themselves out because they just don't scale. It doesn't work. Uh, so that leaves us with two, solar and wind. And they're good. They're absolutely zero emissions. Uh, they're not always well behaved. They tend not to operate when we ask them to operate. They operate on their own volition. But we can deal with that. So solar and wind is what we've got. Sort of sounds easy. I've got solar panels on my roof at home. I've got a battery in the basement. Problem solved. It's not that easy. Because the reality is, remember I had 72% of all the greenhouse gas emissions come from the energy sector. Now I'm going to look at that 72%, the energy sector. 81% today, through to the end of 2018, 81% of all the global energy still comes from coal, oil and gas. 30 years ago, it was 80% and it's still 80%. The whole energy sector has doubled so that the non-coal oil and gas has increased dramatically but the split hasn't really changed. And for all the effort we put into solar and wind, cumulatively, to the end of 2018, it's only 1.2% of the global energy mix. So I'm not talking about peak power, I'm talking about energy delivered. So if you do the maths, it's not that hard to s replace the 81% share of oil, coal and gas with solar and wind. You need about 70 times more solar and wind than we have cumulatively installed through to the end of 2018. That is a huge challenge. 
That doesn't mean it's impossible, but it is a huge challenge. We need everything going for us. We need strategic commitments, storage and more storage. We need uh, inter interstate transmission lines. We need intelligent digitalization and artificial intelligence and all those things. We need lots of things going for us. And even then, the electricity um, that we get doesn't necessarily meet our needs. Solar and wind are plentiful, so we can get this kind of scale up. But sometimes you need molecules, you need a high density transportable fuel. Of course you can store electricity in batteries, but it's not always going to work. I like to give the example of imagining a ship in the future that's going to carry 100,000 tonnes of iron ore from Port Hedland to Shanghai operating on batteries. It's maybe 100 years from now or 1,000 years from now, but I can't see it in the next 20, 30, 40 or 50 years. You need a high density transportable fuel for things like that. So what could that be? Well, what do you know? It could be hydrogen. Hydrogen, a wonderful, clean, uh, combustible gas, otherwise called a fuel that has no emissions. Now, what can you use it for? You can use it for lots of things. So where I've got the little cartoon of a car, you can think transportation, that's what it's uh, representing, um, but mostly long distance heavy haul. So it's interstate trains, the big trucks, anywhere where you would use diesel is where you're more likely to use hydrogen. Where you would use petrol, you're more likely to use batteries as we go to a zero emissions transportation future. Um, you can use it for the built environment for heating our buildings, not just little houses, but big factories, big office blocks. You can use it for cooking and hot water. Uh, you can use it for transportation in the way that I just described, carrying something else, or you can have special carrier ships that will take the hydrogen from Australia to another country. And if you make that hydrogen in a way that I'll describe soon from a primary energy source such as solar, then effectively we can ship sunshine. And there are, no, there are not many easy ways of shipping sunshine, and we have a lot of it. It's a resource that Australia can use. So where does hydrogen come from? Hydrogen is the by far most abundant element in the universe. Over 90% of all the elements in the universe are hydrogen and it's very abundant on Earth. But nowhere is it freely available like natural gas. So to get natural gas, conventional gas, you go where the prospects are, you drill a hole into the ground, call it a well, and you hit a bubble of natural gas and it comes under its own pressure comes gushing out. There is nowhere on Earth where you can find hydrogen as hydrogen. It's always bound up. It's bound up in you and me, in other words, in organic material. It's bound up in minerals, and it's bound up very, very abundantly in water. Water is otherwise known as H2O. A molecule of water is two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. So you can take a gadget that um, is called an electrolyzer, or you can take fossil fuels, I'll explain in a moment, and either of those can be used to make hydrogen. So an electrolyzer is a gadget that passes electricity through water and splits the hydrogen and oxygen into the two gases. You capture the hydrogen and release the oxygen. So when I think about this big opportunity of making hydrogen, using it to decarbonise the Australian economy, to sell it to other countries so that they can decarbonise their opportunity, there are three things that keep me up at night. That's me lying in bed. The three things are scale, demand and diversity. Scale, demand and diversity. I've already been talking about scale, haven't I? So let's look at that a bit more. And I do want to make the point that just because something's hard, that doesn't mean we should avoid it. In fact, to the contrary, if it's hard and it's big, that's where the industrial economic opportunity lies. So again, imagining a world, let's imagine a world where Australia is exporting as much hydrogen in energy terms as we currently export LNG. And that's a lot because Australia is the biggest exporter of LNG, liquefied natural gas. Uh, we're the biggest exporter in the world. Well, what would be involved if we were producing all of that by taking sunshine to make electricity, 
putting into an electrolyzer to crack water to produce hydrogen. And the only assumption I'm going to make for the next slide that will have some figures in it is that we're making all of this hydrogen from water, from solar, where the solar electricity generators, the solar farms, are in a good location so we get generous output from them. Now, it turns out that the amount of energy in a tonne of hydrogen is, is more than the amount of energy in a tonne of LNG. So Australia's exports in 2018 were 70 MT, that's millions of tonnes of natural gas. You'd have to export 30 million tonnes of hydrogen to have the same energy. And ultimately, customers are buying energy, not the tonnes. Right? So if we're going to answer the question about producing as much hydrogen equivalent to our LNG exports, I'm going to do it in energy terms. So we need to make 30 million tonnes of hydrogen. Well, that takes a lot of sunshine and a lot of electricity. You'll have to trust me on the maths, but it takes 1,980 terawatt hours to make that amount of electricity, uh, amount of hydrogen. Besides Tom Campy and Patrick Hartley, is there anybody in the room who knows whether that's a big number or a small number? It's not an easy number to deal with. So let's think in terms of, is that more or less than the total generation of electricity in Australia during 2018? So in Australia, we produce about 250 terawatt hours a year of electrical energy. So to make that hydrogen for export, we would need eight times, eight times our total electrical capacity. It's huge. It's a huge amount. It's 900 gigawatts of solar panels, solar farms. But if we do it over 20 years and we become increasingly efficient and the costs are coming down in the way they have been, it is achievable, but it's a huge challenge. It's also a lot of land area. It's 18,000 square kilometres. And for those of you who don't think in square kilometres, it's two thirds or three quarters of the largest cattle station in Australia, the Anna Creek cattle station. So even though it's a large amount of land, it's not inconceivably large. And we've done this kind of thing before. If you look at the graph of our exports of LNG, as I said to you, as of 2018, we pipped Qatar and we took the crown of being the largest exporter in November last year of LNG. But it's been a long journey. The first decision to proceed was in 1979, and that's when the Western Australian government um, did an underwriting agreement that allowed the oil companies to sign contracts and go out and raise money. The first drop of LNG to be exported was 30 years ago in 1989. And that's into a known market. It took quite a long time, but we're talking about a big industry that knows how to invest and has patience. So I think this is a confidence building graph that says we've done this kind of thing before. So the second thing that keeps me awake at night is demand, the chicken and egg problem. So until there's demand, you can't build up the production. Until you build up the production, you don't get the cost down. Until you get the cost down, you don't build up the demand. You know what I'm talking about. So in order to talk about demand, I'm going to start by talking about supply. So this is how other people see us. So the World Energy Council commissioned a report and they said that Australia is the giant with potential to become a world key player in hydrogen. The World Energy Outlook that came out last year, you can read the quote, Australia could easily produce 100 million tonnes of oil equivalent of hydrogen, 3% of global. We can easily do it. And 3% of global is a massive amount of fuel. Supply side, this is how we see us. If you look around, don't worry about diving into it, but pretty much every state and territory in Australia, with the exception of the ACT, and they understand that, uh, every state and territory in Australia um, has resources of some kind or another, whether it's a fossil fuel resource to be made into hydrogen or solar or wind resources, uh, to be a player in the domestic and the export hydrogen industry. That's a good thing. So how do you build the demand? There's the chicken and the egg. Well, there are a number of things that we can do and we will be encouraging through the hydrogen strategy. Government has a role. 
bilateral agreements. We are a trusted partner for countries like Japan and South Korea and Taiwan and others, and we can build on those because there are other people who will be offering them hydrogen. And yes, price is the key differentiator, but trust in the supplier is important as well. Industrial hubs, I'll speak a little bit more about these, but basically um, the International Energy Agency put out a big report on hydrogen earlier this year, and they see the best way of building demand is to have three or four users, typically around a port, that then justify the production of the hydrogen. So it could be a, um, an export-oriented customer, it could be somebody who's making ammonia, from hydrogen, so because with clean hydrogen you can make clean ammonia, and with clean ammonia you can make clean fertilizer. Europeans would like that. You can also make clean bombs, but we'll ignore that. Um, <laughs> fleet opportunities, fleet opportunities, buses. There's a lot of interest in doing bus trials because once you've got a fleet like that, you can justify the cost of putting in your first refueling station and having known customers for it. Uh, blending into the gas networks, and Ben Wilson will be on the panel with me later, and he's one of the pioneers in this area. That's conceivably, in future, replacing all the natural gas that we distribute to heat buildings in Melbourne, and Sydney, and, and Adelaide, etc., with clean hydrogen. So when you're cooking your spaghetti, you won't have to feel guilty about the carbon dioxide emissions. Um, the third thing is the diversity of supply. So I had that list of things in our toolkit. Let me put them up again. And we already said that nuclear's out, large-scale hydro's out, biofuels and geothermal wave and tidal, they rule themselves out, solar and wind. It's a little bit scary thinking that we're going to go into a future where instead of being 10 different types of technologies that can substantially contribute to the energy that keeps our civilizations, not just Australia, but all our civilizations around the world going, um, that we're going to go from a multiplicity down to two. Now, the sun's always going to be there long term, the wind's always going to be there long term, but we're going to an era of climate change. We don't know what sorts of things might disrupt supply instead of just for a few hours, for a few days, or a few weeks. So it's a little bit of a worry. Well, there is an alternative pathway for making hydrogen. So instead of making hydrogen from water using clean electricity, as I was talking about, I've already flagged that you can make it from fossil fuels. And if you have a hydrogen that is made from fossil fuels, that gives you a third pathway, a third primary energy supply. Let me elaborate. No one will buy hydrogen that's made from a fossil fuel pathway unless it's clean. But if you just could make hydrogen from natural gas or from coal, there's a vast amount of carbon dioxide produced per kilogram of hydrogen, and therefore the hydrogen would be unacceptable. The hydrogen itself is clean, but the production process would be unacceptable. So this is the process we're talking about. Starting with coal, but it could be natural gas, you heat it in a special way called gasification in the presence of steam, and that then breaks the water and you get hydrogen, but you get carbon dioxide that you don't want. You have to get rid of that carbon dioxide ultimately by burying it. That's called sequestration. The hydrogen you bottle and that's what you sell, that's what you use. So in Victoria, and this is a Melbourne audience, you're in Victoria, you need to be aware that there's a big project that is underway as a proof of concept project in the La Trobe Valley. It's a consortium of four Japanese companies, one Australian company, and it's funded by them, plus the Japanese government, plus $50 million each from the Australian and the Victorian governments, and all up, it's a $500 million pilot project. If it achieves its economic goals, if they can prove that it's workable, they'll make a decision perhaps in 2023 or 2024 to go to large-scale commercial. But it depends on carbon capture and storage. There's a project called CarbonNet that the Victorian government has been running for about 10 years to develop sites for carbon capture and storage. So CarbonNet has been in particular looking at that red dot, which is off the coast in Gippsland, not far away from the Trobe Valley, 
And what they've done is they've mapped out um, all the characteristics and they've done it in detail. And it's called the Pelican site, about 20 kilometers off the coast. And that carbon dioxide that came down the bottom of my previous slide is coming in and it's gonna be buried. And when it's buried, the nature of the formations that have been mapped out, it will be buried essentially forever. Which means that the hydrogen that comes out of the project can be sold on the world market as clean hydrogen. It's an important alternative because it didn't depend on solar and wind. It's actually adding a third fundamental en primary energy source into the system and therefore increasing diversity. The project is called the Hydrogen Energy Supply Chain, HESC in the Latrobe Valley, and it's intended to prove a couple of things. The production of logistics, the hypothesis that this is the cheapest way to produce lots and lots and lots of clean hydrogen. We don't know. The Cost curves on solar and wind just keep coming down and down and down. We haven't seen that yet on the electrolyzers, but if Jeff Connolly gets his way, it will come down and down and down. And ultimately, the cost of making hydrogen from silicon, uh, so, sorry, from um, solar and wind electricity through an electrolysis unit might be cheap enough to be worthwhile. But at the moment, people think that the fossil fuel pathway is the cheapest. I'd say even if they both come down to equally low price, the fact that you get diversity by having some fossil fuel hydrogen is a justification for continuing to think about it. Once you've got the hydrogen, you can ship it by chemically converting it to ammonia. Then you can put it on one of thousands of ships that you can just go out and rent and send it to another country as ammonia where they then strip the hydrogen back off the ammonia. Or you can build a liquid, liquid hydrogen carrying ship, and that's an artist's impression, but Kawasaki Heavy Industries is about halfway through building the very first, and its first job will be to take hydrogen from the Latrobe Valley project from a port that is about to be built in Hastings. And the next picture shows, about two weeks ago, the groundbreaking ceremony for building that port I'm third from the left, but there's a lot of ministers in that picture. It's a really serious commitment from the Victorian government and from the Japanese companies. Now, hydrogen as a story has been around for a long time. You've got to say, Alan, what's different this time? Three things. First of all, you've got countries that are saying, we want to decarbonise, and the only way we can do that is by using hydrogen or importing it. Let me just talk about Japan. I've shown you China, California, Korea and Japan, but Japan wants to decarbonise, but they have very few resources, including very little solar and very little wind. So currently they import 94% of all the energy that they use as oil, coal and gas. So they see that they can replace some of that, ultimately all of that oil, coal and gas, it might take 30, 40, 50 or 60 years, but they can replace that with imported hydrogen. So this time we've got customers saying, hey, customer countries say, we're over here, sell us hydrogen. The second thing is, if you look at the renewables, the plummeting cost of solar and wind and ultimately electrolysis units gives us confidence today that we didn't have 10 years ago, 20 years ago or 30 years ago that we can meet a price target. And the third thing is lower utilisation costs. That thing there is a fuel cell. A fuel cell is what goes into every vehicle that might use hydrogen, whether it's a train or a ship or a truck, and converts the hydrogen back into electricity to drive the vehicle. And they've come down in price, they've come down in volume, they've come down in weight in an almost unpredictable way compared to where they were 10, 15 or 20 years ago. So we've got three things going for us. And now you're seeing it in trucks. That's a real truck, a semi-trailer running with hydrogen. No one can do that truck can drive from Melbourne to Brisbane without stopping to refuel. You might want to change the driver, but without stopping to refuel, carrying a full load <coughs> using hydrogen. That's a train made by the French company Alstom. Um, there's several of these running in Germany on um, regularly scheduled passenger lines. That's me in Japan from a you know, existing hydrogen refueling station refueling a Japanese hydrogen car. That's an artist impression of a ferry that's about to be launched on San Francisco Bay, again running on hydrogen. Now all of this adds up for opportunities for Australia. We have 
lots and lots and lots of what we need to develop a hydrogen industry. We've got lots of um, solar, we've got lots of wind, we've got lots of land, we've also got the fossil fuels, natural gas and coal. So we have the choices, but we're not the only ones. There will be international competition. It's a race, and the race has already started. So on the fossil fuel pathway, Russia has declared that it wants to use its natural gas to make hydrogen. Norway, Qatar, they're all interested in doing it. On the solar approach, you've got all the Middle Eastern countries and Northern African countries, Algeria, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, Dubai, you know, Arab Emirates, all of those. And they're close to the European market. We've got the proximity advantage, of course, with the Asian market. Three big challenges I've gone through, scale, diversity, and competition. I've put it to you that they're all opportunity, opportunity, and opportunity. Okay, so what are we gonna to do to capture that opportunity? As you're aware, the Council of Australian Governments, COAG, the Energy Council has asked myself, supported by a task force and many others, to um, develop a national strategy for their consideration at the end of this year, in December. Uh, the way we've done it, we've broken up the challenges into five major streams. So we've got exports, gas networks, transport. I've mentioned all of those. I haven't mentioned electricity storage and responsive loads, but that's important. You can use hydrogen to store electricity in summer, to use in winter if you need to, for heating houses. And also, because those electrolysis units can switch on and switch off very quickly, they're an ideal matching load for variable renewable energy and industrial purposes. A lot of cross-cutting issues, I won't go through them. So where are we at? In March, the whole of the month of March, we had out a discussion paper and we got about 120 really thoughtful submissions. There are almost no amateur or unthinking or critical submissions coming back to us. There's a lot of support for this process. We did a number of roundtables uh, with stakeholders in April and May of this year. And in July of this year, we put out a series of nine big issues papers and received 70, 72 responses. Some of the responses were books, like 25, 50 pages. That's how much effort people are putting into helping us to develop the right strategy. And we are very, very appreciative. And we've gone and worked our way through all of those responses that came back to us. So where do we stand with the National Hydrogen Strategy? What are we going to produce? It's unlikely to have a lot of hard targets. We can't put a target that we will export 500,000 tonnes of hydrogen by 2030, because it depends on Japan and Korea and them meeting their goals. It'd be very difficult for us today in Australia to say we need a target of 100,000 zero emissions vehicles on the road by 2030. So what we're developing is a framework that will make it really easy for industrial players and for states and territories to develop their industries because we will take away all the barriers by identifying the standards and the regulations and the rules for interstate commerce, the bilateral agreements, the um, working with the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, to make sure that you can carry liquefied hydrogen on international waters, but today you can't. So our goal is more about getting all the framework conditions right, uh, rather than hard targets. And if we get it right, if we get it right, and we and the Australian government and other governments around the world get it right, then I would put it to you that in 100 years from now, we'll have a world that is still magnificent. Thank you.